Penny Pulls. All right, it looks like the right file. OK, whenever you're ready. OK. So um, hi, everyone. I'm going to be talking about auto layout and um, a little bit about uh, auto layout in Xcode 5. Um, has anybody here used auto layout in Xcode 4, especially in Interface Builder? Played, Played with it? OK, that was a nightmare. Um, has anybody gone back and tried it again in Xcode 5? A couple people, yeah. So if you've tried it before and it didn't work for you, try it again, and I'll, I'll show you why, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, first off, a little bit just about myself. Um, I kind of split my time three ways. I do um, iOS consulting and development. I do technical writing about iOS development, and I also do technical training for iOS developers. Um, done a number of bang uh, Articles from Mac Tech Magazine started around 2006. And um, that led to me writing a book for PeachBit, creating iOS 5 apps. Um, and then we also did a small uh, Objective-C boot camp as well. And that led to me working as one of the senior instructors for About Objects. My most recent project is the second edition of my book. This has been fully updated for iOS 7. And I've got a couple copies. They just arrived on my doorstep today. Today was the first chance I actually got to see the thing in hardcover. Um, so I'll be giving away some of those uh, later on. Um, but one of the topics I do cover in the book is auto layout. So there you go. So just some background information on this. Um, I'm going to go a little bit deep into kind of the background on the problem and the theory so that to set up why we would want to use auto layout. Um, to give you a little bit of foreshadowing, there is kind of a steep learning curve to using auto layout. So understanding you know, why you might want to go through that pain can, can be useful. Um, I'm just a little bit too close here. So really, what we're talking about is having our views, our view layouts adapt to change. And there's really two different types of changes that we're concerned with. One I'm talking about is external change. And that's where the containing view uh, changes its size, so all of the things inside it have to adjust their layout. A um, little bit of warning, um, two pieces of warning, actually, that I meant to mention earlier. One is that I originally made these slides for an eight-hour workshop, so I've really had to cut things down. So I'm not going to be able to go into super depth into everything, but hopefully I'll give you enough information that you'll be able to understand the topic and then do more exploration on your own. That's my goal for today. The second one is that I, I'm really going to focus on the iOS side of this. So if you're an OS 10 developer, um, it's 99% the same. And a few places where I know that there are differences, I'll point those out. But all of my examples are going to be iOS oriented. So just so we know that. Um, so for external changes, uh, some of the obvious things on iOS is auto rotation. When you rotate the device, the, the, the view changes. It goes from being landscape to portrait, and out, your layout has to change. Um, we also have things like the active call and the um, audio recording bars. Those are the green and red bars that appear at the top of the screen. Um, you can adjust for those. Uh, you can use it to adjust between the 3.5 and, and the 4-inch screens. Um, so you can make one layout and let auto layout deal with the difference in the size of the screens. And you can use it um, to support the difference in the control sizes between OS 6 and OS 7 if you want to be able to support both um, in a single application. The other type of change is internal changes. And that's where our content changes. And because our content either gets bigger or smaller, we want to adjust our layout to fit. Um, this happens a lot with images. Different images might have slightly different aspect ratios. And so you'll want to adjust, fine tune the layout based on the actual aspect ratio of that image. Um, one of the big places it happens with iOS 7 is with dynamic type. Um, I don't know, are you guys all familiar with the new dynamic type feature? Yes, no, maybe, yes, OK. So basically, this is a feature if you implement support in your app, then the user can change the font size um, by going into the settings and adjust the font size. And your app will automatically pick up those changes. Um, it's a great feature for people like me who are starting to have to use reading glasses. So I really, I'm very pro uh, dynamic type. But it often means that we need to respond to that and, and adjust our layout. Um, and then internationalization. Obviously, when you start changing the language, um, the size of the text may change. Uh, the typical example is going from English to German. Usually, you need much bigger labels. And um, auto layout will help you with that. It's interesting in that auto layout will also help you deal with like going from English to Arabic or Hebrew, where you're going from a left to right language to a right to left language. 
you can have the controls automatically shift their position based on the reading order. So there are three main ways that we can actually deal with these changes. Uh, the first one is just programmatically. We can go in, uh, we can examine our view hierarchy, and we can change all of the, the bounds, the frames, the centers to whatever we want. The second one is using auto resizing masks. And this is kind of the old school way. Um, this one really only works for external changes. So if you're doing, if you have internal changes, you'd still have to go and do it programmatically. And then we can use auto layout. And uh, my spoiler alert is um, this is the one I'm recommending people actually start using. Um, it's more powerful. I'm using a slightly weird definition of powerful here in that the system does a lot for us. Obviously, if you're doing it programmatically, that's also, a, that's also powerful, but that's another diff definition of powerful where you can do really anything you want, <laughs> but you have to do everything yourself. And it's also the most complex. Um, so there's a lot to learn and a lot of details to master to get it to work right. Just to cover some of the background, this should be background information for most people. Um, when we're doing it programmatically, we're going to be modifying the views, frame, bounds, and center. Um, each view will have its own coordinate system. Obviously, on OS X, the coordinate system is the bottom left. In iOS, it's the top left, just to make life interesting when you're trying to follow a tutorial that was written for the opposite system. Um, and uh, what these numbers mean depend on the, on the coordinate system that you're working on. So the frame is your position and size in your SuperViews coordinate system. The center is the position of your center point in the SuperViews coordinate system. The bounds is your position and size in your own coordinate system. Um, so just modifying those properties, we can you know, calculate and set up everything. Um, and this has the advantage of being very easy to understand. And it's very powerful. We can literally do anything with it. We can make any changes we could possibly conceive of based on changes in the size. Um, but the disadvantages are that it's extremely tedious to write this code. Um, I find it to be very error prone. Um, I have never programmatically laid out a view and had it work properly the first time. I, I, I don't think I've ever had that for, for any non-trivial view. Um, I've always screwed up something, had to, had to run it, look at it, draw boxes around on my views to see where they actually ended up, debug it, go back, fix it, and, and it takes a long time. Um, it's difficult to maintain, and it doesn't scale well. The more views that you add to your view hierarchy, the more interactions you have to keep track of, the more calculations you have to do whenever you want to update your layout. So unless you've been doing this a long time, and this, you're really good at it, and this is the, your preferred way of doing it, I would recommend not doing things programmatically. The auto resizing masks. Um, this is really designed to automate the most common changes when you're doing the programmatic layouts. Um, and basically, whenever there's a change in our superviews bounds, we define how our, the subviews are going to adapt. We have six different parameters, like the top margin height, bottom margin left, r width, right. And we can set these to either be fixed or flexible. So if it's flexible, then when the superview changes, that parameter will change. If it's fixed, it won't. Um, most of the time, we can set this either programmatically or in Interface Builder. Most people probably experience it in Interface Builder, where you have the little red eye bars and red arrows, and you can go in and you can click those to, to turn on and off those different features. Um, if you've used any of the recent version of Xcode, uh, this is turned off by default, because Auto Layout is turned on by default. And you have to go in, and, but you can go in for any nib or storyboard file and turn auto layout off and get this control back so you can actually go back and use um, auto resizing masks if you want. Um, I feel like this approach is actually relatively easy for people to master. It's complicated enough that it's not something that most people get the first time they try it. But you do one or two sample programs, and you, you get pretty comfortable with it pretty fast. Uh, like I said, you can choose to do it programmatically or an interface builder. And it can greatly reduce the amount of code that we have to write to do our programmatic layouts. Um, the disadvantage, the main disadvantage for me, is that it really only handles a very few types of layouts. There, there, uh, um, layout situations. And um, it only handles the external changes. And so this means that 
usually you have to supplement the auto layout or the auto resizing masks with programmatic code. So it's not a complete replacement, it just replaces part of it. And you're going to end up with a hybrid of the auto resizing masks and some programmatic layout. So all of that is just kind of historical stuff with uh, iOS 6 and I think it was the last version or maybe the previous version of OS 10, I don't remember which. Um, Apple introduced auto layout as, a, as an alternative. Um, and the goal here is to actually create a system where we can declaratively define um, our layout constraints. And the system will actually calculate the layout for us. And we don't need to do any uh, programmatic layout at all. We shouldn't have to programmatically set anything up ourselves um, uh, other than the constraints. Um, once we have the constraints set up, the system should do everything for us. So um, there are basically two steps that I think are important when it comes to mastering auto layout. The first one is understanding the basic under underlying logic. So when we're doing this, uh, they often describe it as uh, declarative programming or a rules-based programming or constraint-based programming. Roughly, those are, are synonyms for each other. Um, so we're going to be setting up a number of rules, and then the system will figure out the layout based on those rules. And this is a very can be a very foreign feeling uh, type of logic problem if you're not familiar with working with it. The other thing you have to understand is the API. And uh, auto layout brings it. It's, it doesn't have a lot of API, but it does have some massively long methods. Uh, and you need to know what those methods do and how to call them properly and when to call them. The good news is this is really different than no, this is really not any different than any other programming task. So anytime we, we write code, we have to understand the basic logic behind what we're doing, and we have to understand the API. Um, the only difference here is, like I said, this is a slightly different type of logic than we're used to dealing with. But just like we were able to master you know, objective-oriented programming, procedural programming, with a little bit of practice, you can master this as well. It's really not any fundamentally different than anything else we've done. Um, I had jumped ahead. <laughs> OK. So a little bit of theory. Um, if you don't remember anything else from tonight, this is the most important piece of information I have on any of these slides. If, you're, if you are using auto layout, you should never be modifying the frame bounds or centers of any of your views. You don't want to mix programmatically laying out your views with auto layout. Choose one or the other. Um, Instead, we're going to be defining constraints and it, that will define how the views relate to each other. And the constraints are going to be expressed as a linear equation. So we're going to have one attribute that's going to be equal to a multiplier times another attribute plus a constant. And all we're going to do is we're going to create a bunch of these. Um, once we have enough of these, the system will be able to accurately and uniquely calculate the position for every single view in our view hierarchy. Uh, so it basically solves the set of linear equations. And it's important to realize that the equals here is not an assignment. So I'm not setting attribute 1 to this value. Um, it's equality. So when the system solves these equations, it might change attribute 1. It might change attribute 2. It might change both of them. Um, I've seen a lot of people have trouble with this because they think that they're assigning a value here, and that's not what's going on. For the attributes, we have a number of different attributes that we can use. Um, here are the edges, left, right, top, bottom. Leading and trailing are based on the reading order. So for English, uh, leading would be the left edge, trailing would be the right edge. For Arabic, it would be reversed. Uh, leading would be the right edge, and trailing would be the left edge. Um, width, height, center x, center y, baseline, and not an attribute. Not an attribute is used if you're trying to set a constant value, so the attribute 2 value won't ever be used. So you'd set that to not an attribute. Just some examples of how this works. So if I want to set a constant height for a view, I just say that view's height is going to be equal to 0 times not an attribute plus whatever the constant, 40. So this would be, give it a height of 40 points. Um, 
If I want to set a fixed distance between two buttons, I would take the button 2's leading edge is going to be equal to the uh, button 1's trailing edge plus 8 points. And 8 points is the standard distance between two um, sib uh, sibling views in your view hierarchy. Um, we can give two buttons the same width by just setting their widths equal to each other. We can center something in its super view by using the, the center x and center y and the super view's center x and center y. We can um, even give things a constant aspect ratio. So I can say my view's height is always twice my view's width. Um, more complicated things like this you won't be able to do directly in Interface Builder. You'll have to go in to do this programmatically in code. But most of these others we could actually do um, in Interface Builder. So our goal is to create a non-ambiguous, non-conflicting layout. So we have our set of constraints, and the system is able to calculate one solution and only one solution to those constraints. Um, if we calculate more than one solution, if there's more than one popular solution, yeah, let me try that again. If there's more than one possible solution, then we have an ambiguous layout. If there are no possible solutions, then we have a conflicting layout. Um, and those are the two main errors that you'll run into. Um, so typically, that means that our constraints must explicitly or implicitly define the width, our height width, the x coordinate, and the y coordinate of the upper left hand corner of our view. Um, we don't have to actually explicitly define those. I could define where the top is and where the bottom is, and then the height is just the difference between those. It's, it's implicit. Um, or I could define where the top is and what the height is, and then the bottom is going to be implicitly defined. So, but somehow, we have to get this, these values for all of our views. Oftentimes, this requires two constraints per axis. So for each view, you're going to have you know, two x constraints, two y constraints, and then you're pretty much going to be good to go. Um, now, why is this often? And why am I saying often and not always? Well, it's because I lied. Um, I lied in a couple of ways. The first way I lied is when I said these were um, uh, linear equations. They're not really equations. They can also be inequalities. So we can set constraints that are either less than or equal, equal, or greater than or equal. And obviously, if you have um, inequalities in your constraints, you're going to need more constraints in order to define a unique layout. Um, so here's an example down here where the width is going to be greater than uh, 20. So that gives us a minimum size for our view. But that in and of itself does not define the width, because the width could be 20, 21, 22, 6,000, whatever. Uh, so we need more constraints to, to specify that. The second way that I lied is that constraints can also have priorities. Now the priorities range from 1 to 1,000. If the priority is 1,000, it's going to be required. So this, if the system cannot um, uh, satisfy that constraint, you'll actually get an error. Um, unfortunately, you typically just get a bunch of garbage printed to the console, but at least it tells us that there was something wrong. Um, all other constraints from 1 to 999 are optional. Um, the system will first try to satisfy all of the required constraints, then it will try to satisfy all of the optional ones, starting with the highest priority working its way down. Any constraint that it, any optional constraint that it can't satisfy will just get skipped. Um, and oftentimes, the priorities and the inequalities work hand in hand with each other. The third thing, so those two can both require us to do additional constraints and make a, give us a little more flexibility in our constraints, but require us to do a little additional work. This one actually saves us some work. Um, views can have an intrinsic size, and that is a size based on its content. Uh, so for example, if you have a button, based on the title that's placed in the button, it will calculate what it thinks is the correct size for that button. Um, if you have an image view, based on the image that you place into it, it will calculate a size, the intrinsic size, based on that image view. Um, the intrinsic size can define either the height or the width or both. So a text field 
typically has the height defined, because that's a pretty standard size, but the width is typically not defined, so it's not, it doesn't claim to have any intrinsic width. Whereas a label or a button would have both height and width. And these are defined as pairs of inequalities, um, which makes it really easy to set up minimum or maximum sizes based on the content. What these look like, taking it to pseudocode, is you know, we have the compression resistance and the content hugging. The compression resistance is, can be thought of as the force pushing out, preventing the view from being collapsed below its intrinsic size. The content hugging is the force pushing in, uh, keeping the view from stretching beyond its intrinsic size. Um, and it has an x and a y for both of these. We end up with these four inequalities. And since each of these can have different priorities, we can make some of these required and some of these optional. Um, oftentimes, for example, I'll make the compression resistant required so that I can, it can stretch as big as it wants, but it's not going to be allowed to shrink small enough that the text gets truncated, so the text will never get truncated. Um, again, that can be dangerous when you're translating things to German because there might not be enough space. <laughs> but then you probably have to talk to your translator about that. So I think I briefly talked about this. Um, we have ambiguous layouts. We have a few different types of errors. Ambiguous layouts is one. That's where we have more than one solution. Um, this one is kind of hard to discover because the system will not actually, by default, tell us that we have an ambiguous layout. It will just pick a solution and display it on screen. So oftentimes, we discover this because we, we, we run the app and things are not wa the way we thought they are. Or we rotate it and they don't change the way they, we thought they should. Um, you can, there are actually API that you can go in and check to see if you have an ambiguous layout and you can actually get information about the ambiguous layout. Um, I'll put you, point you to some references to those. Uh, but by default, we don't find out anything about this. Um, the second type is conflicts. Um, and this is where we have two or more required constraints and the system just cannot physically solve all of them. Um, what it will do is it will actually pick one of the constraints that's going to win and lay out the, the, the views based on that. And then it will spew a bunch of information to your console telling you that you have a conflicting constraint and telling you which constraints are conflicting. Um, so as long as you're keeping an eye on the console as you're running the app, um, it's pretty easy to detect these and notice when this is going on. But it doesn't actually kill the application. The application will try to run and will try to produce some reasonable uh, layout for you. Um, the third one is errors in our logic. That's just where you know, we put a bug in. It's our fault, nothing to do with, with auto layout. We just, we just did not do the constraints right. It's, we told it to do something else other than what we wanted to tell it to do. And it's often hard to tell the difference between the ambiguous layouts and the er errors in logic. Um, and when I've talked about the ambiguous layouts, that's really when you're doing it programmatically in code. As you'll see, uh, Xcode in Interface Builder gives us a lot of feedback that makes this a lot easier to handle. So, um, so any questions so far on the theory? No. OK, good. So I'm going to go just briefly over how to programmatically create constraints. Um, I would highly recommend, if this is something that you're interested in learning more about, that you actually create a project and try to do all of the constraints um, just in code. Uh, because you will learn a lot from this. Be understanding what's going on um, in code is really helpful when you start doing an interface builder, because you know what's magically going on behind the scenes. Um, and this really helps kind of solidify these concepts, in, 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 at least in my head it did. Um, there are times where you will want to do things with auto layout that you just cannot do in Interface Builder, so you, do have, you will have to drop down to this level at times anyways. Um, a good example is I had an app that had a button and I had a star, and I wanted to have the center of the star over the top left corner of the button. Um, and being able, it's relatively easy to do with auto layout, because I could say the, the star's center x is equal to the, um, the button's left edge and the star's center y is equal to the button's top edge. But those are not actually constraints that you can do in Interface Builder. You have to do it in code. 
So I ended up doing it all in Interface Builder. I put in some, and I'll show you this when we get to look at Interface Builder. I put in some fake constraints, just a, a hard code in an X and a Y position for the star to put it where I wanted to. So at least when you brought up the file in I the storyboard, it looked right. Um, but I selected those as being constraints that actually got removed at runtime. And then I added the actual constraints at runtime. Um, and that's a feature. It's a more advanced feature. And I'll point it out again. It'll make more sense when we see it. Yeah, but I still use, I'm a really big fan of using um, Interface Builder as much as possible. Um, and uh, I know a lot of developers don't like to do it, but um, man, I'm so much faster with it <laughs> than I could ever be doing it in code. So, um, so anyways, this here is our main method that we're going to call. It's class method on NS layout constraint. Um, NS layout constraint is the class of all of our constraints. Um, and you can see it has a lot of um, arguments. Um, and this layout constraint, constraint with item attribute related by to item attribute multiplier constant. <laughs> the good news is this is a direct translation of the, uh, the, the pseudocode that I showed you earlier. So um, the first item is, and the attribute defines the, the attribute one. The second item and attribute define the attribute two. Related by is either you know, less than or equal, equal, greater than or equal. And then you have your multi multiplier and your constant that are just constant uh, CF float values. Um, the items, it's kind of important. It's not necessarily, uh, most of the time, those will be UI view or UI view subclasses. But there are also these top and bottom layout guides that are not technically views that we can use for those positions as well. So um, the layout guides, I just mentioned them. Uh, the UI view controller has these two properties, top layout guide and bottom layout guide. Um, and we can use these to draw constraints. And um, their goal is basically to tell us the bottommost position below any bars that we have. So if we have a status bar, navigation bar, a toolbar across the top, the top layout guide will be right at the bottom of the, the, the bars. Uh, the bottom layout guide is similar for the bottom of the view. If we have a, a tab bar or toolbar across the bottom, this would be right above that. If not, these would be the top edge and bottom edge of the view. Um, so oftentimes, when you're dealing with height, the, the y-axis, you'll want to use these guides so that when you take your view and you lay it out once, and then you shove it into a navigation controller, it automatically adjusts for that extra 40 some odd pixels. Um, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, however, in the first release of Xcode 5, I did run into some bugs with the bottom layout guide and the tab bar controllers, where the, uh, the tab bar would not, it would not pick up the tab bar the first time the application was run. And if you rotated it and rotated it back, then it would pick it up. It was very frustrating. <laughs> so so uh, test it out before you rely on it too much. The other thing that really catches people is that when you just take create a view and you just put the view in your view hierarchy, the system is automatically going to create default constraints for you. And these constraints will be based on that view's um, auto resizing mask, one of the reasons why I talked about that earlier. Um, by default, a view has an auto resizing mask where it has a fixed height, a fixed width, a fixed top margin, fixed left margin, and a flexible right margin and flexible bottom margin. So it's going to stay at a fixed position and fixed size relative to the upper left corner. Um, and so by default, the system will add constraints for you to do that. Um, this is potentially very, very useful um, because if we're using the default constraints, we can still modify the frames, bounds, and, and center of that view and everything will work the way we expect it to. So this is kind of a, an escape hatch from auto layout if you want to be able to kind of programmatically deal with things. You can give it the default constraints and then modify those parameters, those properties, as you would expect to. Um, if we need to turn it off, we just call this, they love their long method names, set translated auto resizing mask into constraints, pass in no 
Um, Interface Builder, as soon as we add a constraint to a view, it will do that for us automatically and turn off the default constraints. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about this is the default constraints that Interface Builder produces seems to be um, a little bit undefined. I, I've noticed that I get different default constraints when I just drag a view in Interface Builder and when I programmatically add the view. When I programmatically add the view, I get the, the fixed height, fixed width, top left corner that I expect. I've gotten different results dragging things into Interface Builder. So uh, I'm not sure why. <laughs> and that may change with later builds. But as you'll see later on, there, there are times where I recommend adding views programmatically. And that's why, because that, that's been more reliable for me. Okay. When we add a constraint, we just call this add constraints method on UI view. And there's a corresponding remove constraints. So we can actually remove constraints if we want to. Um, the trick here is which view do we add the constraint to? And we're supposed to pick the uh, closest ancestor to both of the views that are in the constraint. So wh well, what does that mean? Well, if I'm adding a constraint between a view and its super view, which is very common to do to like, set its position relative to the super view, I would add the constraint to the super view. The super view counts as its own ancestor. It's the ancestor of the button that we're adding. Um, so that's the closest common ancestor. Um, if I have two buttons, for example, uh, inside the same view, they, we would add the constraint to the super view, the common super view of both buttons. Now, if I have a much more complicated view hierarchy, I might have to dig up stream until I find the common ancestors. That can be a bit of a trick. Um, that's another place that things often go wrong. Um, we can also programmatically d interact with the intrinsic size. So if we override this intrinsic content size method, we can return whatever intrinsic size that we think is best based on the, our view's content. Um, it should return a CG size. And it, that CG size should be based entirely on the content of the view. You should not base it, calculate it based on things external to the view. Um, by default, UI view has uh, no intrinsic metric for both the x and the y. So a, a vanilla UI view will not have an intrinsic height or an intrinsic width. Um, if we need to recalculate the size, to force the system to, to recalculate all the intrinsic sizes and then relay out the view, for example, if we received a notification that our dynamic font size has changed, you would just call invalidate intrinsic size, and that would trigger it to recalculate everything for you. So then the system would call your intrinsic constant size method, it would get the new size, and then it would lay things out based on the new size. Um, we can also set the compression resistance and content hugging priority using these methods. Um, you see that there are two arguments. One is the priority. We can put in either a number or we can use one of the uh, handy constants. The other one is the axis, and we would just specify whether it's the x-axis or the y-axis. So you, you have to specify them separately. So that's all I'm really going to talk about for the, for the doing it programmatically. Um, there's one other option, doing it in code, and that is using this visual formatting language. And I don't know, has anybody played around with you know, like drawing things with ASCII art before? I, know I, spent, I always spent way too much time in the late 80s doing that. Um, this is for you, if that's something you were ever into. Um, so I'm not going to go deep into this. Let me switch back here for a second. Because um, I, I see a lot of real value to knowing how to do things in code, because you really you want to understand the underlying concepts of what's going on behind the scenes. And also, there are times where that's really the only way you can solve the problem. Uh, the visual formatting language is a great way to simplify the amount of code you're writing. But it's still a lot more work than doing it in an interface builder. And it doesn't, if you can't do it in an interface builder, you're almost certainly not going to be able to do it with the visual formatting language. So um, if you are a person who loves to do everything in code and you don't want to touch IB at all, this would be something to look at. Um, otherwise, I would recommend either doing interface builder or doing the low level method calls directly. Um, so the idea here is 
we have this uh, constraint with visual format option metrics views. The visual format is going to be a string that's going to have special characters in that will define the format. Options will allow us to do other constraints as well. So if we're defining a row of buttons across our screen, we could also say in the options that those buttons should be uh, vertically aligned based on the baseline. So we can, we can get both the horizontal constraints and a single vertical constraint all at the same time. Metrics is a dictionary. Um, the keys are strings. The values are numbers, NS numbers. And those will be constants. We can use that string to refer to that constant value in our formatting string. Uh, views is very similar. The keys are strings. The values are our views or our layout guides as well. And uh, we will use those strings to refer to those particular views inside the formatting string. This returns an array of constraints. And so we can use the add constraints to the remove constraints to add or remove an entire array of constraints at once. Just to give you an idea of how it looks like. Um, so up top here, the capital V colon means that that's going to be a vertical constraint. If that's not there, it's a horizontal constraint. The pipe symbol means that that is the edge of the super view. And the dash means that it's the standard spacing. And then the brackets means that it's a, it's a view. So it'll, it'll look up view one in the view dictionary, and that will be the view that it will do. So it'll do a, a constraint between view one and the edge of view one's super view. Uh, similarly, this would let us set view as having a width of 200. It's width because it doesn't say v colon. And we can do it as inequality, where we can say view is going to have a width that's less than or equal to 200. Um, you can get really fancy and have multiple inequalities. So we could say our view is greater than 50 or less than 200. Um, we can set one view's width equal to the other. And of course, if this was a vertical, it would be one view's height that's equal to the other. Um, we could even add priorities. So this would be a view with a width of 200 at a priority of 500. We can use contents, or constants from the metrics dictionary. So that would pull the standard value and the high value and use standard for the width and high for the priority. And then this is where you really see it all come together. Um, so this is the case where I would have the left edge of my super view, standard spacing, one view, standard spacing, another view, standard spacing, another view. And all three of these views would have equal width. And so I can define all of those constraints in one, one line. So this is um, a considerable amount of code that I don't have to write. So that's really useful. The disadvantage, of course, is there's no type checking, so, uh, except at runtime when it crashes. Uh, so if you misspell any of these you know, strings, you're going to have errors. Um, and as of yet, they, don't, they haven't built in a lot of like, uh, static analysis support for this. So you just have to kind of be careful. So all of that's kind of background, because I really think that the, um, if you're programmatically writing all the constraints, you're going to be writing a lot of code. And it's almost enough code that arguably you're not saving yourself any time over just programmatically laying out your views. I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of code to write. The real benefit of auto layout is when you start using Interface Builder, because that's when you can really start to speed up your development. And you can really start to save yourself a lot of time and do things very quickly. Um, also, as a side effect, um, when you're using Interface Builder, we get a lot more immediate feedback. And so we can know immediately whether we have a conflicting constraint, or whether we have an ambiguous constraint, or whether the system thinks that our constraint is perfectly valid. Um, slight warning there, it, it's, only, it, it's not checking every possible change that could be made to your layout. Uh, it's just checking, basically, if you rotate it, will it still work? So it is possible to have either ambiguous or, co or conflicting constraints where, like, if you, I, I ran into this with dynamic fonts, uh, dynamic type, where I changed the size of something internally, and uh, it actually produced an, uh, a conflicting constraint. And I was like, wow, Interface Builder is telling me everything's fine. Well, it didn't check for that. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's not perfect, but it's much, much better and does give you instant visual feedback 
on the most common things. So, um, I don't have any slides for Interface Builder because I think this is inherently a visual thing. So hopefully, um, okay. Oh yes, I need to change this. See, I didn't test this. This was a problem. Um, oh, no, that's not what I. Um, I can never remember how to do this from time to time. Arrangement. There we go. Yay, OK. Good. Now, the next question is, can you actually read anything that's on here? This I actually don't want to have up. No, stop opening projects. OK. So I'm going to just create a single view application just to give us something to play with. And I will just drop that on my desktop. It's fine. And is that too small to see? Looks pretty tiny. Let me. That looks a little bit better. Is that, can, you, can you guys see that pretty well? OK. I'll go with that. Um, yeah, I could change the presenter font, but most of it's going to be in, uh, in IB anyway. So, um, so we're not going to have a lot of text to look at. OK. Um, so first, I want to kind of go through and show you where the tools are hidden. One of the frustrations of dealing with this in Xcode 5 um, is that Apple has kind of scattered where the different tools are in several different places. So it's often hard to know where you find the things that you want. Um, so first off, down here along the bottom, we have these four buttons. Um, and that is where I'm actually going to recommend that people spend most of their time. The first one is the Align tool. So typically, you will select two views in your, in your layout. And then you can align them based on their leading edges, trailing edges. Um, you can also select just a single view and horizontally or vertically center it within its super view. Um, all of these allow us to pass it to set a constant that would be an offset for the alignment. But if you're doing that, you have to make sure that you, which order you select them in, because that's going to determine which side of the equation the constant gets added to. Uh, so I find that a little bit tricky, and I don't ever really find a real practical use for it. Um, basically, I just use this for the raw. I want all of these things to be aligned on the left. Select them all. Click the uh, turn on the leading edge left, and just create the constraints. Um, the pin tool, on the top here, we can create constraints between the view and its neighbors. So its neighbor might be the super view. It might be a sibling view, like a button or a text or a label or something that's sitting next to it. Um, and I'll actually show you how to go through and select which, make sure you're actually creating the constraint that you want to the view that you want. We can also set a, a, just a constant width or height for our view. We can also select multiple things and set them to have equal widths or equal heights. And we can access the align controls here as well. But if, if I'm going to do that, I'll typically do that through the Align tool. So I don't usually mess with that too much. This guy um, has some great features and some scary features. Um, so let me step back for a second and say, if you've dealt with trying to use Interface Builder and Auto Layout in Xcode 4, 
um, it, IB really, really tried to be helpful, and it tried to automate as much as possible. And it also tried to prevent us from being able to create conflicting or ambiguous constraints. Um, and this created a problem, because you would drop in your views, and it would automatically create constraints based on what it thought you wanted. But if that wasn't what you actually wanted, it could be really hard to get from what IB created to what you wanted, because usually you have to go through a completely invalid uh, state, and it wouldn't let you do that. So um, you would often have to do like add temporary constraints to allow you to delete one and then modify it, and it would be this really tricky logic puzzle to get everything exactly the way you actually wanted it. And then if you added an, made any change at all, usually adding things, it would recalculate all the constraints and completely override all that hard work that you had done. So it was basically not usable. Um, to compensate, in Xcode 5, it really doesn't do anything for you at all. We, we have to do everything, uh, tell it explicitly what we want it to do. Um, and this is actually a really good thing, because this does give us the freedom to go through these invalid states on the way to an actual valid state that we want to be in. So that's where we get into some of these. Um, update frames. Uh, you'll often use that when you, you've added a bunch of constraints, and it will tell you that the constraints w and what you see on the screen are not the same. So you'd say, update the frame, and it would actually update it to where it should be. Um, add missing constraints and reset to suggested constraints. Those are kind of scary, in my opinion. That will cause um, Interface Builder to automatically generate a bunch of constraints for you. Going through constraints is not the easiest thing in the world to determine which constraints are what. So I tend to avoid these and just do everything um, by hand, because it inevitably does something that I don't want it to do. But the clear constraints, that can be really useful. If you've gotten yourself into a situation where it's not working, you can actually clear the constraints, start over again. You can do it. These top ones work on a single view, or however many views you have selected. These bottom ones work for everything in this scene, so everything managed by this view controller. Uh, the last button down here, you can kind of determine how things resize when you apply the constraints. So this is kind of the automatic, the li limited amount of automatic resizing that Xcode is going to do for you. Um, I typically don't mess with that, but you can go in there if you want. Um, in the editor window, we have under the canvas, um, menu item, there's um, a lot of information that we can optionally display. Uh, so right now, it's going to show the constraints, which is really the only one of those that's auto layout related. But we can also show like the intrinsic size. Um, uh, we can show uh, view the involved views for a selected constraint. So if you select a constraint, it would highlight the views. Um, we can show the layout and the bounds rectangles. I don't typically turn these on by default, but when I'm debugging something, it's often nice to come in here and start turning on additional things to get uh, more visual feedback. Um, the live auto-resizing sounds like a good idea. As soon as you add a constraint, it will automatically change everything based on that constraint. That's not typically a good idea, because the first constraint you add typically won't have either a width or a height. And so the system will say, oh, it's a zero width, zero height, and it disappears. <laughs> so, so I usually leave that off uh, for sanity's sake. And up here at the top, we also have like the pin tool, um, the resolve layout issues, uh, the align. These are similar to what you can do with uh, these buttons down here. I usually use the but find the buttons more convenient than going up to the editor menu, but you can do those there as well. Um, and then once we actually get some constraints, I will show you um, uh, what I'm trying to say, how, how those are used. Um, so let me just grab some buttons here. I am not looking at what I'm doing. That's what I want. Oh, goodness. What have I done? Yeah. There we go. 
So I'm going to make this a uh, custom button and give it an obnoxious color. Nope. Um, farther down. Just so we can kind of see what's going on here. Yeah, let me make that a little bit easier to see. I don't think it's good. Anyway, so we have a button. You can't really see the text. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to make a couple more buttons. And one of the nice things about auto layout is I don't have to be super precise about where I'm putting these on the screen, because once I add the constraints, it will automatically lay it out based on what I actually specified in the constraints. Um, if you look at Apple's documentation, they often do the control drag to set the constraints this way. Um, I actually don't recommend doing this this way, because it will take whatever your current position is and turn that into a constraint. And it's really easy to be like off by half a pixel or off by a pixel. Um, I like to use this guy, because it actually gives us you know, perfect pixel, pixel accuracy. So for example, on the left side, I can say that I want to use the standard value. And you'll notice that this also will have a list of possible views off to the left that I could draw the constraint to. Right now, it's just the super view. So that's all I really need to do. On the right side, I'm going to say standard value again. Now you'll see here, I have uh, three different views. And we can tell that the only thing that's distinguishing them is the difference, is the distance. Um, I'm going to pick the closest one. But if you wanted to, you could go in and set the Xcode label for the different views to make it easier to work with. I highly recommend doing that. And for the bottom, again, we have an option of doing the constraint to the bottom of the view or to use the bottom layout guide. Um, it's tempting to say that I want to use the standard value to the bottom layout guide. But the standard value will actually use the eight point, treating the layout guide as if it was an internal object. And I, I really want the 20 points there. So I'm going to just hard code it in as the 20 points. And then you just say add three constraints. And they show up as little bars here. Now you can see these two are blue. That means they're good. That's a, that, those are valid constraints. This one is orange. That means that that's actually an um, ambiguous constraint. And I got this little arrow up here at the top. If I click on that, it will actually tell me what I need to do to fix this. And what happened is, when I added a constraint between these two buttons, it adds the constraint to both of these. So it turns off the default constraints for both of these. That's fine for this button, but not for this one, because I never defined its, its Y position. So when I'm doing this one, you'll also see I get a little, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but I get a little uh, dashed orange box. That's where it thinks the position actually should be. Um, based on the intrinsic size. Um, so that's not right either, but we can fix that. And I don't need to do the left side, because that's already done. So I just need to do the right side, um, standard value, and the bottom, and add those constraints. And then I do the same thing for this guy. This side, I can say use the standard. This side, just 20 points. OK. So now we still have orange because things are not in the correct position. Um, there's actually two problems. One is that everything has the same uh, hugging property, so it doesn't know which one it should stretch. So this is ambiguous because it, does, it doesn't know how to break the tie. Um, so we can go in and follow the advice and change one of them. Um, the other thing it tells us is that these views are misplaced. If I actually go and say, uh, update all views in frame, um, you'll see it randomly picked the middle one to stretch, and it lays it out. That's not really what we want, though. What we want is to say that all of these guys have equal widths. And when I update the frames again, you'll see that we have nicely evenly spaced equal width buttons. When I run this, 
you see that they, they adjust as we expect and they stay equal width as you, as you rotate. Um, how are we doing on time? Is, do I need to wrap up? Huh? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, okay. Um, I feel like I've gone long, so I'm going to skip a couple of things, though. But the layout and scroll views. Uh, this is some place where that can cause a lot of problems. Um, and this is because the scroll views do not necessarily act the way that you expect them to. Um, the reason is, is that when we deal with scroll views, we really have two different sizes that we have to be concerned with. There's the size of the scroll view frame, the, the window that we're looking through, and then there's the size of the content that actually gets scrolled back and forth up and down inside that window. And we can use, we need to use auto layout to specify both of these sizes. Um, and this is done in a non-obvious way. Um, constraints between the scroll view and anything outside of the scroll view, so it's super view or anything else in the view hierarchy that's not a sub view or part of its, its, its sub views, um, will we'll set the frame. Any constraints between the content, so anything that's a sub view of the scroll view and the scroll view, will set the content size. Um, so depending on where the view is, it will be interpreted differently by the layout system. The only exception is the scroll view's height and width. And I can have something that's inside the scroll view and refer to the scroll view's width, and it will actually use the width of the frame, not the width of the content, because that would not really make sense. <laughs> but that is the one exception. Um, so what I recommend doing is, I, I, I was going to do a longer demo here, um, but on, on the purpose of time, I skipped it. But this, so this isn't going to work really well for the scroll view demo. Um, but what I recommend doing is you create a scroll view and then you add a, a view to be the content view. And then you can specify that content view size, either by just adding constant constraints to say that I want it to be a certain size. Oftentimes, I will add constraints to say that I want it to be the same height as my scroll view and the same width as my scroll view, because I, want it to, I only want the scroll view there for when the keyboard comes to move things up and down. Um, or, or I'll say I want it the same width as my scroll view, but I'll let the height be determined by the content. Um, but, ha but separating that, having a, having a scroll view, having a view inside the scroll view, and then laying out everything inside that view really simplifies this. Otherwise, the logic between how to both lay things out and define the size of the content gets really complicated. Um, so I haven't found a, a so what I, yeah, yeah, so what I would do, Yeah. Um, so if I did like a, just to give you a quick demo here, if I drop a scroll view in here, and then I would just put a view inside that. Oops. Let's not do that. OK. I've never seen you do that before. That's a little bit bizarre. Yeah. Now it's going to take more than that to throw me off my stride Xcode. OK. So then I put just a, a content view here. And then I could go and um, let me get back to my actual list of views. So if I say I want to draw a constraint uh, between these two guys, that's the scroll view and the content view, um, and I can say that I want them to be uh, have equal widths. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Equal widths. And now I can select my content view, and I can give it just an arbitrary height, just for purposes of demonstration, like uh, 800. Um, and now if I have just drop something in here, Something nice and visible. Nope. Oops. Switch. Yeah, we'll just put it right here. When I run this, 
I'm always a little bit nervous when I go off script on my demos. Um, and it's not scrolling. What did I do wrong? Um, oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. I also need to tell it that it should um, fill to the edge of the, uh, that's your yeah, that's the content view. So it's, it's going to go to the edge of the screen. Um, scroll, scroll activation. So let's, let's also tell the scroll view, because I've involved it in constraints, so now I need to set all the constraints for it as well. And I can just tell it. That's fine. Okay. So yeah, so now this will scroll up and down. But I can't scroll it side to side because I, I fixed the width to be the same width as the, the scroll view. Um, so does that answer your question? So it's, it's not hard to do, and, and oftentimes um, uh, you can just lay out your content as you would, and, and it, will it will determine the correct size for this, for this content view you know, in one dimension or the other. But separating it like that, having that se separate view in there, really does help simplify this. I did that kind of fast, so um, if anybody has any questions on that, I can go over that a little bit slower. But I want to make sure I get things done and let you guys ask questions. Um, the other area that commonly causes trouble is when you're doing core animation. Um, because core animation, typically, the way it's traditionally been done and the way that um, UIKit Dynamics often works, if you want to play with the new cool UIKit Dynamics stuff, is they rely on modifying the frames, the center of the views in order to move them around. And if you can't modify the frames and the centers if you're using auto layout, sometimes this will look like it works. Um, sometimes it will look like it works until something forces auto layout to relay out everything and then it will jump back to the position where it thinks it should be. Sometimes you'll get weird glitches where it animates and then it jumps back or it animates and it flickers back and forth because the systems kind of com com uh, compete. You have two different systems competing for where this object should be. Um, so yeah, don't cross the streams. Try to avoid uh, mixing both custom constraints and core animation. Um, so there are ways around this. And the one way that I typically use is I'll, if I have a view that I want to animate in, I will programmatically add the view. So that way I'm guaranteed to get those default constraints and I know what they're going to be. Um, and, then I'll, I, and then I can animate it, modifying its, its frame and its center. Because like I said, the default constraints, that's fine. It works as we expect. The other way is we can actually change the constraints and animate the changes to the constraints. Now, this is a little more hardcore, and I don't necessarily recommend it to anyone, but um, we can modify an existing constraint. Now, the only thing you can modify is the constant value. Um, everything else is read-only. Constant's the only one that's read-write. But oftentimes, we can use that to reposition something, either x and y. Um, we can also just remove a constraint and replace it with an entirely new constraint. That's a little more, that requires a little more computation than just uh, uh, modifying the constant, but it's possible. And the key is, is that after you make this change, then inside your animation block, you have to call layout if needed. And that will trigger it, the change to be animated instead of just done instantly. So that's the catch to doing that in animation. Um, like I said, this was really just an overview. Um, I tried to point out the major gotchas that I'm aware of and uh, uh, kind of the theory behind it so you guys kind of get an understanding of that. Um, I do have some recommended resources. Um, I've got some copies of my book that I'm going to give away. We do a project through the entire book, and we use auto layout everywhere in the project. So there are some non-trivial examples of doing auto layout in there. Um, the WWDC, video, WWDC videos are excellent. Uh, the 2012 videos have a lot of really great information on background and theory, but ignore everything they say about Interface Builder. The 2013, that's the one that tells you how to use Xcode 5. But it doesn't cover the background. <laughs> um, the auto layout guide is, that Apple provides is well written, well worth reading if you're interested in this. There's a tech note that specifically talks about the scroll view issue that I was, that I was showing you and explains that. And there's a book out, um, Auto Layout Demis Demystified Second Edition. I haven't actually read this yet, but a number of developer friends whose opinions I trust have said it's excellent, so I'm going to pass that on to you as well. <laughs>
Um, feel free to follow me or contact me if you have any questions. I will warn you, um, there's kind of a hierarchy here of seriousness. Um, I put things on my blog that I tend to be technical and serious. And Twitter, I put you know things that my son has shoved up his nose today. So you can pick your own level. <laughs> um, any questions? Yeah. Um, so one of the frustrating things is that you can't draw constraints between cells. And I've tried, I mean, I, I've even tried like programmatically digging through the view hierarchy to finding the correct um, view that should be the common ancestor and, and programmatically adding constraints. And I've just never gotten it to work right. Um, so, um, so that's a little bit limited there. I wish there was a way to do constraints between cells. Um, if you're doing like in storyboard where you're where you have the, the uh, dynamic um, prototypes and you're laying out the dynamic prototype. Um, oftentimes, yes, that you can use auto layout and it will actually help you determine what the row size should be, height should be. Um, so I do that a lot. Um, um, yeah. But, uh, but oftentimes I want to align things between different cell prototypes and you can't do that. <laughs> so, so. Anything else? I find that more frustrating with uh, static table view cells because those typically I have more, com I'm trying to squeeze a more complex layout into a table view and uh, yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, um, that's all I have. Okay. User group raffler. <laughs> um. Oops, I can leave this up.